that you stay muted, but if you do have any questions or comments for myself or the panelists throughout the webinar, please use the chat or the Q&A function. Um, and this webinar is being recorded and will be uploaded to the CDTC YouTube channel. Okay, so um, you can only earn AICP credits if you attend the entire live webinar. So if you watch this later on on the YouTube channel, you cannot get credits. But um, if you are an AICP member, there are one and a half CM credits available for this webinar. Um, and if you are a planning or zoning board member and your municipality has approved CDTC events and trainings to meet the New York State training requirements, you can also get credit. So CDTC hosts these webinars on the third Tuesday of every month. If there is a topic or a planning strategy that you'd like to hear more about, please contact us. Um, we are continuing to fill our our calendar for next year. Next month, uh, we will have a webinar on the TIP, the Transportation Improvement Program. That's the capital plan. And how does it work? And in November, we'll be um, doing a review and an overview of generic environmental impact statements as a transportation planning tool and hearing from some of the communities in the region that are using them to collect impact fees and invest them in transportation and other, um, and other operational and uh, infrastructure. You can find all previous new visions, um, whoops, um, sorry about that. You can find all of our previous New Visions webinars and our other resources and materials on the New Visions webpage. So today we have a really great lineup of, of, up of panelists. Their bios are all much longer and they're all very impressive, but I just want to do a brief introduction of each and you will have the pleasure of hearing from each of them in just a bit. We have Katie Newcomb, um, the Chief Economic Development Officer from the Center for Economic Growth. Katie has more than a decade of economic development experience spanning multiple states, public, private, and nonprofit sectors. And she's currently leading the Center for Economic Growth's business attraction and expansive, expansion activities, directs and implements strategies for entrepreneurship growth workforce and talent. Um, we did plan on having Sean McGuire from the town of Colony join us, but he had a last minute emergency. So unfortunately he had, a can had to cancel. But if you do know Sean, um, you know that he is a great local economic development leader and uh, he's always great if you need to reach out to him to ask him a question about local economic development. We also have Jamie LaHutt from Metroplex and the CDTA Board of Directors. Jamie was appointed to the CDTA Board in June 2017 and elected as to chairman in 2019. And Jamie was the first executive director of the, um, sorry about that, it cut off at Schenectady Metroplex. And Megan Daly um, is the Chief Commerce Officer at Port of Albany. She's the um, Chief Commerce Officer at the Albany Port District Commission, where she oversees economic development, business development, strategic development and opportunities, grant development, project assistance, communications, marketing, and sales. And as you'll find out in just a bit, there is a lot of exciting stuff going on at the port today and into the future. So we're going to start off with a short overview um, of the New Visions 2050 plan. What does it say? What is the current um, state of the region? And how is how um, what do we say about economic development or how the transportation system and economic development uh, impact each other? Then we'll hear from Katie on what makes the capital region a good place for businesses or how we can become a better place for businesses. and then we'll go to Jamie for how transportation and economic development are connected in the capital region. And then to Megan on the Port of Albany as a catalyst for economic development. And to wrap it up, we'll do a brief summary and discussion. And again, if you have questions, if you put them in the chat or in the Q&A, we will get to them at the end. 
So briefly for um, anyone who's not familiar with CDTC, but I think most of you are, we are a metropolitan planning organization for New York's capital region. And MPO is a transportation policy making and planning organization that allocates federal transportation funding resources to local transportation infrastructure projects and planning programs. So um, someone once said, and I've been repeating and kind of stealing this phrase that the capital region is kind of a constellation of cities. Um, we are really unique in that we're multinodal. Uh, all of our cities, our county, these four counties, minus Moreau and South Glens Falls are part of the MPO. The MPO also includes um, regional and state transportation planning and regional planning partners like the State Department of Transportation, the airport, the Regional Planning Commission, CDTA, the Port of Albany and the Thruway. So, um, one of the major products of uh, CDTC and all MPOs is the Long Range Regional Transportation Plan, which we, we refer to as New Visions 2050. And New Visions 2050 is a blueprint for regional transportation that reflects a shared vision for the future. Um, who is this vision shared by? It's shared by transportation providers in the region, our local governments, state agencies, private sector stakeholders, and the public. And this plan guides the prioritization and funding of federal investment decisions that are made through the MPO process. You may um, have seen the New Visions 2050 plan. There are several components to it. The executive summary is kind of like a brochure of the plan and really covers the, the major highlights and uh, key points. But there are also um, 11 separate technical area papers ranging from transit to congestion to bicycling and walking. There's also a financial plan and a glossary. And all of these documents can be found um, on the CDTC website. And if you're wondering what implementation of a long range plan looks like, these are just some examples of major uh, infrastructure investments that have been made um, because of the priorities and strategies laid out in previous New Visions plans. So these planning investment principles are the centerpiece of our plan. They influence the types of tasks and initiatives that we support. And as you can see, uh, support economic development is its own principle. Um, and again, these are all, all of these principles are directly related to our programs and initiatives that we fund um, each year, but they're also used as criteria to prioritize um, TIP projects, so capital projects. If when we're doing a TIP solicitation, which as many of you know, we recently announced a new one, um, when people, when communities propose projects, we evaluate each of those projects based on these principles. In addition to the principles, there are also major policy and best practice recommendations in the new visions plan, including maintaining um, a state of good repair in our transportation system, managing congestion instead of um, expanding roadways, implementing complete streets, implementing transit oriented development and smart growth, access management, implementing safe systems, or what some cities are referring to as vision zero policies, um, complying with the American Disabilities Act and expanding our public participation. So just um, a little snapshot of the region before we get into the topic. We're a slow but steady growth region and the most recent census data shows that our region is gaining and not losing population like some areas of upstate New York, but projections do not predict significant increases in the future. Our region uh, values its livability and we have low unemployment, affordable cost of living and great amenities and culture and recreation opportunities. Um, despite the slower speed of growth, a mix of housing, zoning and other land use policies have driven um, a lot of newer housing development to the edges of the region, which creates uh, what we call a jobs and housing mismatch sometimes and increases the amount of driving people are doing on a daily basis. 
So New Visions outlines a strategy for managing growth, encouraging infill development, and investing in a transportation system that can support better housing choices and improve access for all. This, of course, requires maintaining and improving a $30 billion system of roads, bridges, sidewalks, and trails to support continued economic growth in the region, um, including bridges over the Hudson River that carry over 270,000 vehicles per day and bridges over the Mohawk River that carry over 230,000 vehicles per day. Uh, many of these bridges are over 50 years old. Some are closer to 70. Um, and the system also includes a number of major transportation hubs like the Port of Albany, which we'll hear more about in a bit, and the Albany International Airport. We can't afford, forget the growing network of walking and bicycling facilities. Currently, we have about 1,200 miles of sidewalks, 130 miles of trails, and that number um, has been growing so rapidly that we don't always know the most up-to-date uh, mileage number, but we think that's pretty close. And 33 miles of on-road bicycling facilities like bike lanes and cycle tracks. Additionally, but not pictured, CDTA has over 300 buses, 60 routes, and over 3,000 bus stops it manages and maintains, plus a growing menu of shared mobility options like the CDPHP cycle and scoot and soon to be car sharing. And this whole system relies on over 14,000 miles of road and bridge infrastructure. So, um, you know, related to that infrastructure, we continue to see the impacts of climate change, mostly in intense rain and storm events that watch out, wash out roads and, and do uh, crumble a lot of these important facilities that we've built. And we know that greenhouse gas emissions contribute to climate change and the single largest source of greenhouse gas emissions in the region are from transportation. So that's me and you um, driving to work or for errands every day. So other people are noticing what a great region this is to live. Uh, it's Albany metro area has been placed in some of the, the lists of top places to live in the US. And if you follow the local housing market or if you've tried to buy a home in the last year, you know that there's a lot of competition um, in part because of the, the region seeing an uptick in new reg residents from outside the region. Um, CDRPC's Regional Economic Recovery Dashboard has been tracking an array of economic indicators in the region. And one of them um, is this in-migration from the New York City area that's pictured here. So we don't know if increases in remote work will make this a long-term and sustaining trend, but it's definitely something that we're watching and we think that everyone should be thinking about as we plan for the future of the region. So a big part of what we do is public outreach, engaging where the public's at in terms of the long range vision for the regional transportation system. Most poll results, show, most recent poll results show that there's strong support for transportation alternatives like transit and walking and bicycling facilities. And unsurprisingly, um, the most support is for investing in the current existing system. Nobody likes potholes. Um, but the prioritizing of walkability and bike friendly neighborhoods in cities is definitely reshaping the way communities and the way the region has been designed and having uh, measurable economic impacts. One uh, recent economic impact um, that I think it's related. People may have seen some stories in the news have been through the pandemic on local bike shops, which have had a really hard time keeping up with the demand for bicycles. And if you visited a local trail, you've seen that um, there's a lot more more users out there than there than there typically has been. Um, so how how does the transportation system impact the economy, and why? Um, so this is surely not an exhaustive list, but just some examples of, of how they impact the local and regional economy. When we talk about what we need to do to repair, to enhance or expand infrastructure and services, we often focus on the price tag of building or funding it. And we're not as good, when I say we, I mean CDTC, um, at explaining the return on the investment. And often the return can range from new jobs, um, new job for someone previously unable to access one because of where they live and the transportation options available to them, 
uh, to new retail opportunities, to the ability to attract people who live outside the state and region to come to visit and to stay here and spend money at local businesses. In 2019, we released the Capital District Trails Plan, and I just wanted to use this as an example of infrastructure with a significant economic impact because we made a specific effort in this initiative to collect spending and property value and other economic data and projected the potential impact of developing a 300 mile connected paved trail network, which at the time was an additional 200 miles to what we had. So this data has been helpful for local governments as they've competed for grants to fund new trail projects based on trail counts that we conducted um, and helped us understand just how many people are on the trails each year, which is about 1.8 million. Um, or in our region, we have about 30,000 trail users per mile. Um, plus the economic data we collected, we know approximately how much each trail user spends per trip and what kinds of trips they're making to local restaurants and farmers markets, to their jobs, to the library. So it would be approximately $2 million to build another 200 miles of trails that would connect the entire regional trail system, which would generate an additional $75 million in new economic activity each year. So that return on investment is a year after year benefit. Um, and we can, we have not yet, but we can do this same, you know, approximate the same benefits for things like sidewalks, for new public transit services, for bridge replacements and other infrastructure. And it's important to remember that as we um, in invest in new infrastructure, that these aren't just big uh, costs, but they, these are investments. So as we advance the goals of the new visions plan, CDTC wants to make sure that we're complementing the efforts of our regional economic development partners. Um, so next we're gonna hear from Katie Newcomb from Center for Economic Growth on what makes the capital region good for businesses and what businesses are looking for in a location. Hi, so I am off mute. Um, thank you so much, Jen. I actually think that your presentation will segue really well into mine. Um, we are a great place to live. Other people have recognized it. We've known it for a long time. Um, and talk a little bit about uh, our regional profile, kind of who we are as we talk about the region and, and, and what we highlight as CEG when we're talking to, to folks outside of, of our region about the benefits of living here or investing here. Um, and, uh, you know, what others are looking for when they're looking to expand or, or to locate and sort of how that, how that plays into what we have as regional assets. I'm gonna just give you a brief overview of CEG. So you get my, you get my elevator speech here. Um, so CEG is the region's economic development agency. At the most basic level, our goal is to drive economic growth. How do we do that? Um, so we do that by uh, you know, proactively marketing the region and developing and implementing strategies to attract investment and talent. We, uh, we work to grow our manufacturing and workforce capabilities, leverage our industry clusters, and help further develop the region's entrepreneurial ecosystem. We also prepare the region to compete, which is an odd statement, I know, but what does that mean? So Jen put up the Regional Economic Development Council strategy. So we provide support <clears throat> to the Regional Economic Development Council in creating that strategy each year. So, so we work with the council members to help craft that. Uh, we also maintain an inventory of sites and buildings in the region that could be ready for someone to locate or to expand. Um, and we do a lot of our own research and analysis. So hopefully you've seen, um, you've seen our name you know, in the paper. We try to drive a regional narrative that is data-driven. Um, and not only within the region, but we use that as we, as we market externally as well. And then we collaborate. So by our very nature, um, we are regional in our thinking. So we drive regionalism, we drive collaboration. Uh, our footprint, and you'll see this as I go through the presentation, is eight counties. Right. So we all have, you know, there's capital district, capital region. Um, and so we are eight counties. 
And because we are eight counties, we can take that macro view, right? We know what's going on in Washington County, what's going on in Greene County. Um, and so we can bring partners together in really meaningful ways. Um, and, you know, Jamie is on today from Metroplex. CEG sort of sits at that regional scale, but we work really closely with our county, our local economic developers, as well as our state economic developers at Empire State Development. The work that we try to do is to complement and leverage. So it is, it is an integrated economic development system. We're not competing against each other um, uh, at, the, at the state, local, and, and regional level. Um, Counties may be competing for investment at times, but it is congenial or it is it is friendly. Um, but but we really we really work you know as a team um, to market the region to ensure that um, that we can, are a place that that folks want to invest in that people want to live in. Uh, so let's go ahead. This is small, but I think it's a little bit readable. Um, so we just launched our, our updated economic profile and you can access this online. Um, I will give you a link later in the presentation and hopefully Jen will can, can share this out. But a little bit about um, the region as we define it. Uh, it is you have eight counties, a little over a million people. So if you sort of compared the region to MSAs, not quite apples to apples, but um, if you compare the region to MSAs, it puts us almost at that top 50 threshold. So we often talk about the region as a million strong because it gives us that sense of scale um, that we're looking for. And it's about the size of Connecticut, which I use often when I'm talking to people from the outside. Again, just so that they have that sense of scale. When they hear Albany, they may not think of it as, as sort of the, the, you know, as much as we can encompass, right? Um, we've got a lot of assets here. You know, 24 higher education institutions. So we're really smart. Um, uh, higher education attainment, both by associates and BA than the US average. Um, and then you, I do wanna back up, uh, but when you look at this, you know, we lead with our infrastructure assets. So relevant to our discussion today, Oftentimes when we are talking to a company that's looking to locate here, we're talking about highway access. We're talking about air access, you know, for their executives, but also because their employees are gonna wanna be able to travel with ease as well as Amtrak. Um, you know, so, so how, how quickly can you get down to the city for a meeting, for instance? Um, so we really do highlight those assets when we are talking to a company about locating in the region. And then your bus service and your bike share, uh, and I'll talk more about this later in the presentation, but you know, not only for sort of the quality of life piece of it, but um, labor is in very short supply right now. We're in a really tight labor market. It was true before the pandemic and it's only gotten, it, the pandemic has only accelerated that. So the idea that uh, of connecting people to employment opportunities through public transportation is absolutely critical. Um, and Megan's going to tell you all about the amazing things that the port does and, and the opportunities that have come with having that kind of asset in the region. It is incredibly unique to have that. Um, and we are really lucky. So, so again, you know, we are, we are smart. Um, we are growing in terms of, of, of real GDP. We are a stable economy. Our unemployment rate has been at or below uh, the national unemployment, unemployment rate for the last 30 years. And in the past, I think that was due to, you know, being sort of the seat of government, but we are a very well diversified economy. And I'll talk a little bit about our industry clusters as we move forward. Um, and you could see our largest employers on there, all of our amazing accolades, um, uh, access to broadband is something else that's critical, something that many of our communities are working on. As a region, we have a, a higher subscription rate, at least in, by, by that metric, um, than the U.S. So that's critical in a, in a shorter commute time. Um, so those are just a, a few of the things that, that we like to highlight. And if you dig really deep or you squint, um, we also mentioned 60 waterfalls in the region, which is a stat that people really love. So I would uh, encourage you to go out and, and pull this economic profile. Talked about industry clusters. So, you know, I often say that, um, you know, clusters and talent sort of drive economic development. You've got to have, you've got to have the people 
and you want to have um, strong industry clusters. You know, we are we are never going to be the automotive capital of the world, right? We shouldn't try to be the automotive capital of the world. Um, we don't have the assets in place. Now, I say that there could be manufacturers in our region that contribute to that supply chain. So don't get me wrong, but it's highly doubtful that a you know brand new Ford or BMW plant is going to land in our backyard. We take it, but but we focus on the areas that we have a competitive advantage. So it could be in labor, it could be in, you know, in, in other areas. And so as a region, when we talk about industry clusters, we really focus on um, advanced electronics and semiconductors. Uh, you know, I would put power electronics in there as well. Um, clean energy, uh, specifically, we're seeing uh, the emergence of offshore wind in the region, and you'll hear that from Megan later. Software and IT, digital gaming, um, we're really growing to be uh, a digital gaming hub and, and gaining some recognition in that area. 500 plus employed um, in digital gaming. And uh, I think we're at 25 studios, um, but I don't know if you should quote me on that. It's close. Uh, biotech and life sciences, as well as advanced materials. Doesn't mean that we're not strong in other areas, but, but these, are, these are sort of the, those core clusters that, that help drive economic growth. Don't try to read this, but when I talk about our, our industry clusters, I will encourage you, and this is hyperlinked, I will encourage you to go out. You can pull sheets on each one of our clusters, um, and we talk about where our advantages are as a region, and then you can also pull the regional profile um, from that area. So as we talk about um, what makes a place good for business, you know, there's sort of some some there's some site selection criteria. And, and this is true for a company that's looking to locate in the region, but it's also true as a company is thinking about expanding. Um, and do they expand here or do they expand somewhere else? And, and what's the business case for making that investment um, anywhere? But, but, but these are the things that we're thinking about uh, as economic developers when we're evaluating projects. First and foremost, it is the availability of skilled labor. This has been true for years. Again, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to this. This has been true for years as sort of that number one um, criteria and, and it, can, it holds true and it's the, the labor market is getting even tighter. So when we talk about it, what's a good place to do business, it's a place with a really strong labor market um, and, and a, a supply of labors and colleges and workforce development programs that are churning out uh, folks that can work um, in these, it, it, you know, on the on the shop floor or in the office or or create their own business. But um, but but again, when we're thinking about uh, availability of skilled labor, that's critical. Uh, highway access. So back to transportation, right? Um, you want to be able to you want to be able to move goods and services quickly or move goods quickly. Um, so you know, matters more for some some sectors than others, um, but logistics is a, is a really important component. Um, energy, labor costs, construction, tax rate, um, again, shipping costs, incentives. You know, incentives are a little lower down. I think sometimes in the economic development game, we, we get a bad rap, but it's, it's really less about incentives and it's more about um, finding the site and creating uh, the case for helping a company invest. And that's what we do. And quality of life. So, you know, that ties very closely to a lot of what Jen was talking about when we talk about um, uh, assets in a region. And so, you know, people, it still holds true. And this is, you know, maybe somewhat anecdotal, but, but many, of the, many of the studies out there have shown that, you know, our millennial and young, maybe our millennial and Gen Z population want walkable communities. Right, there needs to be mobility options, um, and and so that's critical as we talk about that access to public transportation and and bike lanes and and all that kind of stuff. And transportation is again important for that skilled labor piece. You've got to be able to move people to where the jobs are, and for logistics and for quality of life. So, um, I don't know how I am doing on time, Jen, but I will try to wrap this up. Uh, a place that's good for business has to be a place that's good for people, right? So um, if you haven't already visited 
the CAPNY website, I would, I would encourage you to go to gocapny.com. Um, when we talk about, you know, sharing who we are with those outside of the region, we've got to start to define that for ourselves. And so, you know, we do make up, we do have these amazing, this constellation of cities. And how do we talk about them? How do we show them? How do we bring someone in to say, you could live in Albany or, or Catskill or Schenectady, um, or you can live in one of those and you could visit the others and they're amazing. So a couple of years ago, a group started to start to come up with that regional brand, start to define who we are and then how we talk about ourselves to others. And so CEG is using the regional brand to try to attract talent. So it's about growing your own, but then it's about attracting talent in, because again, that workforce is critical to our economy growing um, and you know, both, both from the companies that are here and then the companies that we want to come in. So, so CEG is using this brand to um, market the region for talent attraction. And Jen talked about migratory patterns not of birds, but of people. So, um, uh, you know, according to the Washington Post, and I'm looking at my notes here, but according to the Washington Post, a third of US workers under 40 considered changing careers during the pandemic. Um, and 30% of US adults considered moving. So there's just a lot of change right now. And we wanna make sure that we can talk about this region and its quality of life, its quality of place, is a term I, I, I prefer to use, it's quality of place um, to those who live here and, and to those who want to, to come here. And because um, it really is about, we have vibrant urban centers, there's an affordability aspect to it, uh, an, an incredibly educated workforce, cultural assets, recreation, creative businesses, innovation, we have proximity to, to, to international cities. So, you know, it, a place that is good for business has to be good for people. So both in terms of keeping people here and attracting people. Um, I think that's it for me. Thanks so much, Katie. I think we need like a, like a bike to or hike to waterfall challenge for the capital region. That might be, be fun. A that might be park. fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, so our next panelist is Jamie LaHutt from Metroplex and the CDTA board. And um, I will hopefully get this right and share. Jamie, do you see um, the first slide? I do. Okay, just let me know when to advance them. Okay, and, all okay. right. Um, so I'm Jamie LaHutt, the executive director of the Schenectady Metroplex Development Authority. And I'm also the current chair of the Capital District Transportation Authority. And uh, I'm just trying in my presentation today to combine uh, some of the expertise I have in both of those uh, fields. Um, kind of a spoiler alert is that it'll be more oriented towards um, uh, transit oriented uh, development, really just try to tie together the strategies of the, of the two organizations. Um, go to the next page, Jen. So I wanted to talk a little bit just uh, by way of background about the Metroplex Authority. Uh, we are a one of a kind economic development group in New York State. We were formed in 1998 by an act of the state legislature uh, born of distress in the city of Schenectady. When I started my position in 1999, the vacancy rate in downtown Schenectady was over 80%. Um, and so it was really suffering from the departure of people, uh, the decline of uh, General Electric or at least General Electric Company moving out of Schenectady. Uh, and so we have really focused on um, uh, really trying to be a catalyst for a development and a revitalization of downtown. But we also do projects in uh, the towns and neighborhoods and attract private investment. We're a one of a kind organization because we have a stream of revenue from the county's uh, sales tax receipts. Uh, this year, that'll be about $10 million. And we have all the tools in the economic development toolbox. We have powers of eminent domain. We have $100 million in bonding authority. We can override uh, local planning and zoning ordinances, although we've never done that. Uh, we think of ourselves as a um, 
bricks and mortar agency. We're not a bank. We're not a lender. We don't, you know, we don't help finance equipment, working capital, inventory like many economic development uh, groups do, and, and as I did in my uh, earlier career. Uh, we really work with property owners, and we want to make sure that um, uh, that they can renovate their buildings or improve their buildings and expand the local tax base. So we make loans and grants. We buy and sell buildings. We provide tax breaks to property owners and private developers. In our statute, we're empowered to design, develop, plan, finance, create, site, construct, renovate, administer, operate, manage, and maintain facilities within the Metroplex Service District. We do not cover all of Schenectady County. We have like a franchise area. So municipalities have to opt in from the original, um, the original footprint that was established by the state legislature. So we cover a large part of the, of the county, but not all of it. And certainly all of the uh, uh, commercial business zoning areas in Schenectady County. Um, but we've also, you know, our focus has been on downtown but we certainly have invested in our, in our neighborhoods, the outlying towns, as well as uh, the industrial parks that are, that are here in, uh, in Schenectady County. Um, next slide, please. So um, just a little bit about our you know, success. Uh, we have spent over $210 million uh, since our inception, leveraging over $2.5 billion in, in other investments probably tells you more than a billion dollars just doesn't go as far as it used to. Um, but we have worked on over 800 projects. Uh, we have had our hands involved with 5 million square feet of, uh, of, of new and renovated uh, commercial uh, space. Uh, we'd like to think that we really have done a lot to revive downtown Schenectady. A lot of the focus initially was on arts, entertainment, and culture. Um, more recently, it is on, uh, on, on market rate housing. It's been a big change just in the last six or seven years on, on that front. Uh, but we focus on, on projects big and small. Um, Proctor Theater, of course, with their major expansion about 15 years ago. Uh, we've done projects with General Electric, Mohawk Harbor on the river, our first big uh, river access project. Uh, we worked with the, the downtown bid here, the, uh, the Downtown Schenectady Improvement Corporation. We also manage all the off-street parking in downtown Schenectady, working with, with Laz Parking. And one of our goals is really to make the downtown, you know, clean, neat, and safe every single day of the year. So we have um, um, invested a lot in public uh, infrastructure um, on State Street, Union Street, uh, Stratton Plaza behind Proctor's Theater with lighting projects, new, new streets, new sidewalks, water and sewer projects. Um, it's kind of a um, best kept secret in Schenectady that we've invested that much uh, in Schenectady and it just prepares the city, the urban area for uh, ongoing revitalization for generations to come. And we, you know, I would like to think that we generally follow a lot of smart growth uh, principles with our investments in, in the business parks in the county and then really focus on, you know, urban redevelopment and urban revitalization. On the next slide, please. And then on CDTA, um, as Jen mentioned, I've been chair of the board there for a couple couple of years now. Um, you know, C CDTA is really the fabric of the of the capital region. Everybody knows about CDTA, even though their ridership only represents about one percent of the population here. Um, but we provide a, a variety of services uh, with the local routes, but also with the with the rapid transit lines, with the with the red line that runs from Schenectady to Albany, and the blue line that's running from Albany to uh, uh, Troy and, and Waterford, and the purple line is in development right now. Um, the uh, the commuter express from uh, down, up and down the Northway, our paratransit services, and we have the new electric bus systems that are coming on. Buses are are fantastic, and we're trying to follow the state mandate uh, for building up our electric buses to. Uh, uh, 50% of our of our fleet by uh, 20, 2025. Uh, and then we're also looking at potential expansion into both Montgomery County and Warren County. So we will sort of be stretching out, I think, over the course of the next year or two. 
Uh, and then in the next slide, um, we talk about some of the things uh, that have already been mentioned with uh, the mobility services uh, that CDTA has been involved with, with the CDPHB uh, cycle program, uh, the new car share program, which is, which is just getting ready to come online, like zip cars that you'll see in other cities, uh, scooters in its pilot uh, phase right now, um, but it's extremely popular. I've heard more about scooters than probably anything else CDTA does. Uh, we have the Flex program, which is really our type of um, Uber transport um, in, in our suburban areas, and then the, the, van, the van pool um, program. Um, and so what you can see is that CDTA is not just a bus company. It's really uh, provides a basket of mobility options. We like to give people options and choices uh, to besides their own vehicle. Um, and we think that that offers really substantial benefits for, for the region, better mobility, reduced car traffic, uh, lower spending on, on transportation for many families, the healthier lifestyle, less pollution, um, and we think higher foot traffic in our commercial areas throughout the region. So next slide. So, you know, when, when we talk about just that connection between um, transportation and economic development, um, you know, I, I originally was going to start by saying, you know, just build a road and, and probably economic development will follow, which has probably been the case for most of America's history. And certainly as recent as, you know, 30 years ago, that was a focus for, for transportation. Um, and as you can tell, things things are definitely uh, changing. And CDTA, I think, is is reacting to those changes and with a lot of different things going on in, in the region. Um, you know, transportation has driven economic development to a, a large extent. Um, but as I was saying, you know, 30 years ago, the question was really, you know, where do, where do you want to build a particular highway or road and, and how would that lead to, um, uh, to future development? Um, but, it, but, you know, now we're talking about different ways of, of changing and uh, our emphasis on, on growth. And I think Metroplex is a, a great example of, of focusing in on, on um, um, how to, how to, where to have the growth, how it occurs emphasis on, on urban revitalization and the allocation of our resources. There's only limited funds going around by, by government. And certainly, you know, in Washington, there's a lot of discussion about, you know, infrastructure, transportation is, is certainly a part of that. Um, the next slide, please. So, so we have this uh, uh, kind of symbiotic relationship between transportation and, and economic development. Uh, you know, efficient transportation systems, uh, you know, facilitate regional development and economic growth. Um, conversely, rapid, you know, uh, community development increases demand for transportation services. And I, the capital region, sort of, certainly historically, we've sort of seen how that has worked with the development of the Northway and other major uh, transportation systems. Um, you know, economic development comes with its own you know, cost to uh, to maintain with congestion, uh, development problems, sprawl. Um, and so it's really a bit of a balancing act uh, with transportation and economic development on, on the overall uh, health, health of the region. Um, but CDTA, I think with offering, you know, its options, CDTC certainly has, a, 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 as Jen was showing in an earlier presentation, with the, the, the bike trails, walk trails, expansion throughout throughout the region, um, I, I think shows uh, the changes that are, that are taking place, uh, some more obvious than others. And I think these issues with, with CDTA are really at, at a very you know, early stage of, of where things will be going with both public transit and uh, changes in development. Uh, on the next slide, I, I just wanted to make mention of uh, some uh, parking parking issues. Um, you know, Metroplex, as I mentioned, is involved with the um, off-street parking system in, in downtown Schenectady. Uh, we um, manage over 2,500 parking spaces. The on-street parking is about 800 parking spaces. Um, you know, parking comes into play whenever you're talking about economic development. I'm, I'm sure Katie hears, hears about this quite a, quite a bit because you're always trying to balance uh, you know, the requirements of businesses um, and, and their use of cars. Um, 
Schenectady is a nice, small, compact city. You know, I look at every parking lot that we have as a potential, you know, redevelopment site. Um, but at the same time, we really, you know, need the parking. Uh, but we would also love to see a, a future of, uh, of uh, you know, jitneys and shuttles and autonomous vehicles being able to move people around the downtown from Mohawk Harbor to downtown Schenectady, try to serve uh, businesses and in our business community uh, better than we are, take advantage of the compactness of the uh, of the downtown of the downtown area. And then I want to uh, conclude on, on the last two slides by just looking at some of the uh, examples of of, uh, of uh, transit oriented development. Uh, with the uh, redevelopment that's going on at the uh, the Harriman campus, which will uh, be a, a primary spot for our uh, purple line that's now under uh, development by by CDTA, really being able to you know transform the campus, but also with an emphasis on uh, on, on travel by by bus and other modes, the limited available uh, availability of of parking. You know, it's worth noting that one of the innovations that that CDTA has has made is uh, with with the uh, uh, introduction of its uh, of its universal access cards. You know, we work with uh, Albany Medical Center, all the colleges and and universities and and other major employers, and most recently with the state of New York uh, to provide a universal access card where where there's a payment system set up, but for the user of the card provides them with uh, access to all the services that are available and the mobility options that are available by CDTA, whether it's hopping on a bus, taking a bike, grabbing a scooter. And I, I think that is something that has expanded tremendously. Uh, again, it's, it provides a huge resource and uh, it's a great benefit to anyone holding holding one of those cards who works for one of the companies that's involved with CDTA on, on the universal uh, access. Uh, but we are trying to take advantage of, you know, kind of the compact uh, geographic areas that a project like this or the next one, which is downtown Schenectady, a project that's in the works uh, of uh, creating a, a mobility hub on Lower State Street at the uh, at the base of State Street in downtown uh, Schenectady, uh, where we're able to um, uh provide or provide all the um, mobility uh, options that are available. That part of uh, Schenectady, which is right by the community college, has seen a vast amount of development in the last few years, uh, over $125 million. And it is, um, uh, with all the housing that's come online has really uh, changed. And I think it's the kind of demographic that Katie was mentioning of people that wanna have these options, they wanna hop a bike, grab a scooter, you can grab a car uh, sometime in the future. And so we're looking to redevelop that site, uh, hopefully as soon as uh, next year, uh, to have a, something on a much smaller scale than what we were just looking at at the, at the Harriman campus, um, but have it available in downtown Schenectady, right where it's the uh, terminus of all the bus routes, but also provide all these other uh, options that are available. And it's in, in conclusion, it's, it's just worth noting that, you know, certainly we have worked with local local developers and in, certainly in other communities in Albany and Troy have worked with uh, the Rosenblum companies um, with with projects that have taken place. Uh, Redburn Development Partners is a big investor here in Schenectady and Albany, as well as Troy, um, and able to work with them not only on their location, but they work with CDTA. Um, for universal access cards. If you're a tenant in, in their housing projects, you can have a card, again, having access uh, to these, these types of services. Um, and so uh, I think, again, that's one of the changes that we're seeing with the focus on urban areas, revitalization, expanding our, our downtowns. Um, and so um, that's what we're looking to do, both in Schenectady and CDTA on a, on a wider uh, regional basis. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jamie. All right, so our last um, panelist is Megan Daly from the Port of Albany. Um, as many of you know, the Port of Albany is part of the MPO. It is a major piece of transportation infrastructure and it has, um, it's generating a lot of 
economic activity in the region. So it is really unique. And um, so yeah, Megan, we'll let you take it from here. Great, thank you, Jen. Can you see my screen that I'm sharing? I can. Okay. Yep. So hi, everybody. I'm uh, Megan Daly. I'm the Chief Commerce Officer for the Port of Albany. Um, I have to thank Jen for the title. Um, and so I've used it on the uh, front slide here. I think that it's uh, an awesome title about the Port of Albany as a catalyst for economic development. And we are uh, certainly working hard at that. Um, the, what I'll do is start with um, a little bit of information about the port. I'd like to think that everybody is very familiar with it, but just to be sure, I'll start with um, the boundaries. Hey, Megan, so, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Okay. Can, to make it bigger, can you um, do the either at the bottom right hand corner or the top left the, from the beginning play? Oh, sure. Yeah. Sure, sure, sure. Is that hard to see? Is that good? Yes, that's better. Yep. Okay, let's see. There we go. That's still good? Yes, great. Okay, okay, thanks. So um, we just wanted to start with sharing the boundaries of um, the Port of Albany. Um, the port is located uh, on both sides of the Hudson River um, and encompasses 400 acres um, in three municipalities in the city of Albany, Rensselaer, and uh, now the town of Bethlehem, which we'll talk just a little bit uh, more about that. Also, the port is um, 124 miles north of um, the New York City Harbor, which is um, a factor for business, right? And we'll talk a little bit more about that too. So um, in terms of the maritime aspect of the port, um, primarily uh, the port handles heavy lift cargo, um, molasses, which some people may not know. Um, scrap iron is active on uh, both sides of the uh, port in Albany and in Rensselaer. Wood pulp, which contributes to paper and paper products, which was um, extremely active in the last year and a half um, in the region, but also in the world for, for many reasons. Um, certainly power equipment has been a big um, active piece of uh, cargo and business at the Port of Albany. And then wind power. Um, we, the port has handled onshore wind power for years, um, but is now getting into the offshore wind uh, power business, which we're excited about and we'll talk a little bit more about. Um, but the, the port has um, a portion of its operations that is maritime facing and deals with the river and ships. In fact, um, I wish that I could move my uh, screen to see the backdrop of a ship. We have a ship at the um, dock right now working and uh, it's a pretty good backdrop for the conversation. But so, so a portion of the port's operation is maritime uh, facing with um, shipping and cargo activity. And that's how we connect the region to the world and the world to the region. Um, but there are also uh, port tenants that um, lease space at the port and conduct their business operations here. And so all told, um, it contributes to um, economic development opportunities in the region. So I think we each need to have one of those slides where you have to um, you know, look tight to see some of the information. And just some of the highlights of this is, um, you know, the cargo that we handle, the facilities that we handle, um, that there's 400 acres that I mentioned, that there is a, a substantial amount of rebuilt uh, wharf on both sides of um, the river, including pretty soon there'll be wharf in all three of those municipalities that we talked about. Um, in our capacity, we've, we've grown to have a great reputation for heavy lift capacity. Um, around the world. And so that has been a big factor in, in power equipment, um, power cargo, and in some of the scrap business, which scrap is actually a component of recycling, which gets um, worked back into uh, construction products and um, in some cases, vehicle products um, and uh, is, is, is pretty active at the port in connections um, around the world. Uh, one of the ships that was recently at the Rensselaer dock will go out to um, Turkey uh, with uh, loaded up with scrap steel. 
So, and that's one of the things that I wanted to, to point out is uh, the port with its location here in the capital region, you know, we are neighbors here in the capital region, but we also are um, touching and connected to parts all over the world. And this slide is supposed to give a feel for, you know, where cargo may ship to and also where we may get cargo from. One I like to point out is, you know, you may think what's, what's coming or going to Australia. And in this case, you can see the arrow is pointing in and that um, uh, molasses, actually one of the um, prime sources of, of molasses is coming uh, to the port from Australia. And that can be used in, in food products, but it also can be used in agriculture. Um, and, and so we serve the uh, um, New England area in agricultural um, uh, product with that molasses. Um, and then you can see there's um, some of the power equipment may go to different parts of the world and paper pulp uh, can come um, from parts of um, Sweden and parts of um, South America. And so that's, I think, one of the really cool connections about the Port of Albany and the region. Um, another factor is just our uh, highway network and for the businesses that locate here and or um, its connection to um, workforce in some cases, but also into uh, serving customers, not only to the world, but to uh, the, the Northeast. And then um, we are proud that in the last several years, the Port of Albany was the first port in um, New York State to voluntarily um, join and participate in the Green Marine Program. And that has become really important to our mission and the work that we're doing here at the port. So in terms of um, economic development specifically, Jen had some of these um, facts on hers as well. And I was, I was delighted to see that, but the Port of Albany takes part of its mission related to economic development as, as critical. You know, we create opportunities here and um, that has a beneficial impact to the capital region, but also connection uh, to the world. And it's the port administration itself is small, but the, um, the employment that's generated out of the port, either directly or indirectly and through um, uh, tenants and or uh, business partnerships is um, at the port. The last count was up to 1400 employees, but generated throughout New York state um, is up to 4,500. And that's a big um, that's a big number and also shows the multiplier effect of, or the um, effect of the work that happens at the port. There may be one piece of cargo that's being moved and there's employment here at the port, but then either to move that to a place in throughout New York or in another location, there may be you know, three or 10 or 12 additional um, employees matching that. And then also we contribute to um, the region in terms of investments, um, and other spending. And that's something that our leadership, you know, takes to heart and looks at how we can sustain or improve that. And um, to talk a little bit about our mission and our, our vision um, is, is hand in hand with that, that um, in 2016, our board um, directed to do a growth strategy and a market assessment to say, you know, where are we capturing opportunities, where we may be um, opportunities. And one of the primary recommendations was to add to the port's um, uh, land development opportunities. And so the port did that. Uh, we took the um, recommendation did a fair amount of due diligence. Um, and in 2018, the port actually added um, 80 acres uh, to the south of the port, which is this piece of property that you're looking at now. Um, originally with the intention of, you know, adding um, opportunities in economic development for, for port expansion generally. But at the same time, the state of New York and others were um, undertaking pretty aggressive initiative related to offshore wind 
and um, an alternative means for um, power generation, but also how we can develop and capture supply chain um, related to offshore wind in the United States um, and specifically in New York and in the capital region. And so we married this um, site development um, with that initiative. Um, so that's one image of the site. This is another image that shows the overview but this one now is a latest rendering of what the plans are uh, for the site related to offshore wind. Um, so this will be uh, the location of uh, the first offshore wind tower manufacturing facility in the United States will be right here in the capital region. And this is um, the latest rendering of what the operation at the 80 acres will look like. The expectation is that um, there'll be over 560,000 square feet of manufacturing space. Um, the expectation is that there'll be 350 new uh, jobs uh, with this operation here that uh, Marmon Wellcon um, will operate the uh, manufacturing facility. And this is a partnership with Port of Albany, Marmon Wellcon, and also um, Equinor for the Empire Wind Project. This project does also connect with um, an existing site and the existing um, port operations. Just to give you a sense, um, it, it ties together this 80 acres along with um, roughly 14 and a half acres up in the current district that will utilize maritime operations uh, adjacent where all deliveries will come to this facility. Um, and then be connected internally uh, down to the new operation. Um, this project is currently in uh, engineer, engineering design and permitting. Um, the port has received uh, seeker approval um, and generic environmental impact um, work has been complete and approved. And now we are at the site plan application stage um, with plans uh, for construction to um, predominantly occur next year and the following year um, with plans for this to be in operation in 2023 and 2024. Um, and I, I probably should have skipped ahead a little bit. This may look a little bit different. This was one of the original renderings, but we've updated it since, but it's, you know, all similar components. Um, we are... Um, really excited that this will ultimately serve um, the offshore wind um, development that's going to happen in the ocean that serves New York. Um, but the plan is for this to also serve other offshore wind development projects that are expected um, all along the eastern seaboard as different states are really um, opening up competition related to this and seeing it as critical for um, right, climate change uh, for alternative uh, power generation. And we are excited to be playing a role in this. Um, I talked a little bit about, you know, the timeline with this, which is the information on the right, but more so you get a feel for what that site could feel like if you were on the ground, which is what this um, rendering is supposed to, to have you see and feel. It sort of feels the scale of um, the size of not only the equipment, but the cargo that will be produced right here, even the cranes and the backdrop. And this is all going to be ultimately um, placed on vessels that will be floated down the Hudson River and ultimately out to the development sites in the ocean. So it really is, um, you know, appropriate for our topic today related to you know, creating economic development and the benefits of this region and using our transportation uh, system to fulfill that, which in this case um, is the river and, and using uh, shipping, which is really the only way that these big pieces uh, can be transported um, for its ultimate location in the ocean. Um, a couple other things that we just wanted to point out about um, this project is, um, you know, as a, the port is a public authority um, and we have uh, requirements that we fulfill in development projects, including um, utilizing minority or women to own business, businesses, um, 
utilizing uh, service disabled veteran owned businesses as well. And all port projects um, are required to have prevailing wages on the projects. Um, and this is also part of what's fulfilling um, the climate law that was passed in New York a couple of years ago. And, um, you know, really truly creating that connection and, and, and benefit with, you know, nearby environmental justice uh, communities, which um, is, is present here in the capital region and adjacent to um, the port. So we're looking forward to this project offering employment opportunities to um, individuals in the nearby community and also the capital region. And um, we've some of these pictures here show some of the engagement that the port has had for a couple of years with the city of Albany. Summer youth um, that have come to the port, looked at um, offshore wind, but also looked at renewable energy, which has been really cool to interact with. Um, and I think just the last, the last point I wanted to make was, you know, in the last um, 12 or so years, um, the port has, you know, really worked on initiating um, or fulfilling um, plans and projects and investment um, over 500 million in major infrastructure improvements that have resulted in, um, you know, new jobs and new connections to new businesses and new initiatives, and now even a new market. Um, which is coming to the United States with the offshore wind supply chain. And um, we are excited about that and working hard to fulfill it, but we think that the capital region is going to see even more opportunities related to this. So that's it for me. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Megan. Um, I'm so glad you brought up some of the other parts of the transportation system that we sometimes forget about the river, you know, the river and canals and, and um, we don't forget about rail, but the port really, you know, they move products on the river, on rail, on the highways, pretty much everywhere you can. So um, very exciting stuff happening there. So I am just going to um, wrap things up. Um, and before I do that, if you have any questions, uh, please put them in the chat or use the Q&A and uh, we will answer, we will get to them and answer them in just a moment. But um, so continuing with implementation of this long range plan, uh, CDTC does this through our unified planning work program. Uh, we are due to develop a new work program for 2022. Um, we usually do a two-year program. We do have, as you know, a new executive director and we're gonna try new things and we're gonna do a one-year program. And we um, are gonna put out a solicitation for program and project ideas for that. So um, look out for that. And then of course, the transportation improvement program. We just released the solicitation materials for the tip on September 10th. Um, and we have some, some uh, tip information and workshops coming up, which I'll talk about in just a moment. But this is the the tip is the five year capital program, and this is really how we build things that we want that we say we want to see. Um, so uh, this is a huge um, regional investment that's made. We continue our learning series through these webinars. And then if you would like to request virtual training for your planning board, zoning board, town board, city council, maybe you have a complete streets advisory board or some other um, board or committee in your town or city, uh, please uh, feel free to reach out to me and request one, or you can fill out a request form on our website. Other planning assistance uh, and information available through CDTC right now, um, there's the ongoing transportation and community linkage program, which isn't open, but we have a number of studies that um, are progressing. Our, C our joint technical assistance program with CDRPC is still open and we are accepting new applications through December 1st. And those are for small scale planning, um, studies initiatives, data collection, uh, mapping, safety planning, general uh, community neighborhood planning and recreational trail planning. 
We have a number of um, geographic information system resources, GIS resources. We have our sidewalk inventory. We have developed a bike infrastructure inventory. We have a trail database and mapping. We have drone flyover um, video of some of our trail and downtown areas. If anyone needs them for, um, for, for grant applications or just for local promotional um, uh, campaigns, Again, we have bike and trail counts and we are starting a automated counting program. So we have automated counters that we are deploying on an as needed basis to do counts. Uh, we have survey templates and data, safety data, um, funding resources. Our Capital Coexist Mini Grants program is uh, coming to a close for this year. And when we have, when we do the new UPWP, we will determine whether that will be available again next year. Transportation Alternative Program and Congestion Mitigation and Air Quality, or TAP CMAC, uh, those applications are due September 29th. Recreational Trails Program. Um, and then, of course, the TIP. So, um, like I said, the TIP is our five year capital plan. The solicitation materials are on our website. There is a virtual workshop on the TIP scheduled for this Friday at one o'clock. You do um, need to register on the website, and this will walk you through our new online application form, all the information uh, you need to enter, the data you may need, and where you can find it on our website or um, which, which uh, staff can help you with it. Other resources that can all be found on our website. Um, if you're doing bicycle planning and need help doing a level of service analysis or safety campaigns, trail mapping. Um, we also uh, assist communities with managing their GEIS and we uh, have highway pavement condition and the regional transportation model. So, um, I don't see any questions in the chat right now, but I'll give folks a moment if they if they have any questions or want to type that in. Um, I do want to thank um, Katie, Jamie, and Megan uh, for taking the time today to present and and uh, to to talk with us. And I'm really glad that they were able to be here. Um, no question. So uh, this was recorded and will be available on the CDTC YouTube channel. You can also find previously recorded webinars there. Um, if you would like to reach out and request New Visions training or get more information on New Visions or anything at CDTC, please feel free um, to contact us. Again, thank you for joining us, um, and thank you, Megan, Jamie, and Katie, and I hope everyone has a good evening.